And our next activity is our first keynote speech. So before I start, uh, I think uh, I can first introduce our speaker. And it is my great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Professor Christine Goldman. She is a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Texas at Austin, where she leads the UT Austin Computer Region Group. She is also a research scientist at Meta AI Research. She received countless awards, which is very impressive. Um, but due to time limitation, I, I, I'm not going to go through that. And she is an IEEE Fellow, Triple AI Fellow, Sloan Fellow. And her work has been recognized with several best paper work in top conferences. I think um, it is fair to say that she is the leader of computer region with many influential work. And I'm very excited to find that her research has some links with audio. So it's our great pleasure to have her here. Let's welcome Professor Goldman. Professor Goldman, now the stage is yours. Great, thank you so much. Thank you to all the organizers for having me here. Thanks for that nice intro. And I love how you previewed the work of the workshop. That's a great thing to get us all started. Um, so yeah, this talk is about <clears throat> actually some recent and very new work from my group looking at understanding vision together with audio. And for much of this talk, the specific angle that we'll be thinking about is spatial understanding and how both sight and sound have something to say about that. <clears throat> so let's get right into that. Um, here, when we think about sight and sound in a 3D space, meaning a home, for example, or multi some other multi-room indoor environment, there's a lot of ways in which the sounds we hear and the things we see are going to work together for ultimate perception. Just to give examples of that, you know, we, we understand where something is, maybe how it looks, also how it sounds, including when we hear it from afar. Sound and, and what we see will tell us things about what's going on, what are the activities. They'll tell us about semantics and what properties are shared by different objects around our environment. And very fundamentally, these things will come together to tell us something about the geometry of the space and the materials that make it up. And so in my talk today, we'll be touching on some of these elements through examples in our work. And in particular, I, there's kind of two main parts to the talk that follows. And the first part uh, is going to be talking about actually the 3D surroundings and understanding them. So in the sense of understanding the shape of the scene or, or the layout of the scene using both sight and sound. And then the second part is shifting into understanding and learning about human speech in a 3D space and how those things work together, things like sea reverberation or acoustic matching that we can do now we think better because we can bring in computer vision to help. So those are the two main content of the talk. At the very tail end, I'm gonna give a brief plug or preview for a newly published data set called Ego4D. And I wanted to make sure and do that for this audience because it does have some, um, I hope, exciting data for speech understanding, for conversational transcription and um, social interaction of people. So you'll see all that towards the end with a couple examples. Okay, so let's go right into learning about the 3D surroundings. And in general, when we talk about space and sites for uh, spatial understanding, <clears throat> we can think of two sides of the um, influence for what we're gonna hear based on what, what the environment's like. <clears throat> so on one hand, it's the environment itself. So factors from the 3D environment like the geometry of the space, you know, where are the walls, where's the big furniture, as well as the materials in the room, what are all these things made out of? Are they shiny, smooth surfaces? Are they fluffy carpets and drapes? Uh, and then where is the source sound or sounds and where is the receiver? All those things come together to say how we receive the sound in this space. And you'll notice those things I just mentioned, the geometry, the materials, where are the sources, those are things that also would have a visual element that we'd like to be able to bring to bear. So that's one side of it. The other side then is the agent or the, the listener. So on the agent side, the body itself has an influence on what we're going to hear and how we'll hear it. For example, with our two ears, uh, we humans perceiving binaural sound will be influenced by the interaural time difference. You know, when does the waveform hit the left ear versus the right? 
as well as the level differences because our head's right in there and the shape of our ears. So the spectral detail on the, the ears, the outer ear, which will all together come to give us some ability to sense the 3D position of a sound source. Okay, so on the left, the environment, on the right, our bodies, these things come together. And if, if we're modeling both of them um, in a, both the visual way and then audio way, what I wanna show you next is what we can do to improve our 3D spatial sensing. Okay, now to this end, one kind of tool that I'm gonna use in a number of the methods I show you today is a simulation platform we developed called Sound Spaces. So what we wanted was the ability to generate sounds in 3D environments and to do it in a repeatable and highly realistic way to improve <clears throat> both what we can learn and how systematically we can um, validate it. So Sound Spaces is a sound analog of what have become very impactful visual environments uh, in our research community. So 3D environments like Matterport 3D or Replica, these are scanned environments, meaning a camera has been through them, taken panorama images all over, and then these have been stitched together into a 3D mesh from which you can grab any photo you want from any arbitrary viewpoint. So think of this as that's the existing work to do visual simulation, and it had a lot of um, impact for embodied AI research for agents that can now move around in these spaces and, and see their egocentric views at will. So now the analog for sound spaces, we bring in the acoustic um, simulation. So you could get acoustically realistic sound, binaural sound, ambisonic sound, by placing a receiver at any position you like, and it'll gen you can generate sound for the waveform you like by convolving against the room impulse response we pre-computed all, all over these environments. So this means, you know, this is realistic to the extent of it's accounting for geometry, materials, where the walls are, what they're made out of, where the sources are. So I could insert a source at any of these positions and then hear it appropriately anywhere else. Okay, so think of that. I'll show you uh, actually example just a second here. This is compatible with um, a high speed platform called Habitat that allows now um, grabbing the egocentric views as well as the sound at a position that you choose. So what does that look and sound like? Let me give you one example. On, the, on this video I'm about to play, on the left you'll see the egocentric view of a camera moving in the space. On the right you'll see a top-down map that shows you the breadth of the entire space and where the camera is now. And you'll hear, although it starts kind of quietly, you'll start to hear the sounds in the environment that are being rendered with sound spaces. Now you'll hear them getting louder and softer. Uh, what you won't hear because of the zoom environment is the full spatial experience of the left and right ear binaural sound, but you can do that if you listen with headphones from our website. So here we go. Okay, so I hope that you could hear um, the sounds getting louder, the smoke alarm, the piano. Again, the spatial sound, you'll hear it on your left as you walk by. This is all produced in a real world environment that's been scanned and now also has these acoustically realistic sounds that we can draw on um, as the camera position or listener position changes. All right, so I wanted to introduce that because it's gonna help in our goal of modeling space and sound uh, and sight together. And so the first example I'm gonna show then building on that platform to do some self-supervised learning is uh, an example that tries to recover the shape of the scene. So here I'm gonna show you a little excerpt from a movie called Daredevil where this person is blind, but can still see by the results of the echoes in the, the room after he hits this gate with a stick. Okay, so very dramatic. And what this says is, you know, as we already know well, there's some ability, especially those who are, have, have trained themselves to do it well, to be able to understand the space of things around you um, from echolocation. And so the results of those echoes and how we receive them paint a picture of the shape of the scene. And when I say shape of the scene, I especially mean like the depth of all the elements within it. 
Okay, so here's our idea. We would like to be able to leverage this kind of echolocation-based learning in a self-supervised manner to gain visual representation. So when we do this, we're expecting to benefit for spatial tasks. And that can be things like depth estimation, surface normals, or visual navigation for agents that move around in a 3D environment. And the key is going to be to think of this supervision coming in a self-supervised way, not through a stack of data in this case, but from interacting with the world. Just like that character did, you know, hitting and then receiving echoes, we're going to interact with the physical world and listen to the results in order to learn a self-supervised representation. All right, and we're gonna call this visual echoes, and I'm gonna make use of the sound spaces platform I had just mentioned to get training data. So here we are looking at a 3D environment on the left um, from a top-down view. So remember, you can have any camera view you want in here, just place the camera and render it that way. But now suppose we generate training data where we place the camera at various positions and various orientations. So if we look at that crosshair on the left, say we're standing there and looking out towards that door, and we can record both the RGB, the depth, and the echoes. So as we emit a, a, a frequency sweep and then listen to the results, the, in the left ear and the right ear, we'll get the resulting spectrograms for the echoes. Now imagine turning the camera in every other orientation. Now we'll see something different, both RGB and depth, and we'll hear slightly different echoes as well. So you can imagine collecting training data like this in these environments. We have some 80, 90 such env environments from different homes that we can collect in this way. And now we're gonna be interested in building a representation that understands this relationship between the echoes you hear and what you see in, this, in the scene. And before I show you that learning objective, let's first double check that, is it true that you know, a machine as well could take these echoes and learn to do better depth prediction? So what they're looking at here are a couple examples where you have RGB on the left, the true depth in the center column, the, the red means it's further away, the blue means it's closer. And now you see after that three estimates from models that are trying to predict that same depth, either using the RGB by itself, using echoes by themselves, or using both together. And you can see that, yeah, actually, even if you just considered the echo, not the RGB, you're already getting a, the, the ability to learn the relative depths of the scene. You can do it with RGB, we knew this, but look at, they actually work together. So this example shows it well, where in the left-hand scene at the top, the, the protrusion in the wall is, is mistaken as um, something that's a break, a much bigger break in the depth is turning to RGB, but with the echo, it's smoothed out. So it's giving a, a enhanced representation of the 3D uh, or the depth of the scene. And now this is a, a, a waypoint to confirm for ourselves that depth and echoes are, their relationship can be learnable. Um, and that plays out too in the quantitative results, not just the one I'm showing you here. But now let's take it to do self-supervision. So what we've said is echoes are gonna help us understand depth. So now we want to learn a visual representation, one that can persist even if I don't have echoes and audio emissions happening. And the, Self-supervised objective that we set up is to say, let's learn a visual representation that understands the consistency or the congruence between the echo and what we see. That we can set up without supervision because we have this paired data of echoes and visual. So let me show you what the network looks like trying to train for this. So we'll have a stream that's visual looking at um, the RGB. Then we'll have a stream that's audio and it hears the binaural sound here encoded as spectrograms, one for the left ear, one for the right ear. And that's going to be the results of the, the um, sound emitted from the agent. And now here's the key. When we set up this training pipeline, the sounds that we put in as input are going to be one of several things, either the right echo, the echo that goes with the RGB at the top, or an echo that's wrong by some orientation offset. Imagine, remember, take one of those other camera orientations, we would grab the echo from there to create other training samples, either when the agent turns to the right or turns behind or the other way. So now you take these together and you have networks for each modality that can be fused together 
And the objective then for training this representation is to say, predict whether the echoes and the visual are in um, consistent orientation or not. And if they're not, what's the offset? Okay, so you don't need human supervision to do this. You just need to be able to generate these views and echoes in the environment. And so what happens is this visual representation is forced to include within it elements of the 3D scene that reveal consistency with those echoes. And those are exactly the elements that have to do with the depth and the layout of the scene. So I mentioned that we want this to survive or persist even when we don't have echoes. And so the output of this method, visual echoes, is the visual network, the one that can now take any RGB image, one that doesn't have audio with it, and give it a better encoding that's imbued with this notion of depth. And so the first thing we tried is to say, okay, if you have that encoding and you use it to pre-train a depth prediction network, a network that's going to take monocular single view imagery and, and for depth, that how much better can it get? And so remember, no audio input in this case. We've already trained with audio. Audio is gone. Now we test on a real image like these from the NYU data set. The true depth is shown in the second row. If you just trained the state-of-the-art network from who and colleagues, you would get the third row. And if we pre-train their method with our visual echoes, you get the bottom row, which is indeed a cleaner, more accurate depth map. Okay, so this is exciting because a couple of things. You know, one, we're able to learn something within a self-supervised way with the audio and now translate it to real visual. And two, this is an a example of sim to real transfer because we trained all this with our real world environments, but they were scanned and the sound was simulated within them. And now we're testing it on real photos. So in fact, this plays out in the numbers as well. Without for time, I won't go into all these metrics, but you can see that for depth prediction, things are more accurate than the scratch model and even more accurate than if we had trained with heavy supervision on the vision side. And this carries out another task too. So I mentioned surface dome estimation and visual navigation, all having this benefit from learning about environments by listening to them um, as well as looking. All right, so this was an example really trying to understand the 3D environment from what we hear and what we see. And now I wanna get right into the other component of the talk, which is understanding better human speech in a 3D space. And so here we're gonna be paying attention specifically to speech sources and thinking about the effects of the environment on how we hear a person's voice. And we're gonna start with reverberation and in, in fact, trying to achieve dereverberation. Cause we know that the room acoustics are gonna affect how we humans perceive speech, as well as how our machine perception agents perceive speech. And really the reverberation can degrade the quality of speech because of all this sound bouncing around from the environment and its walls and its furniture and so on, so that we hear um, not just the core clean speech that was uttered, but we hear the effects of the environment baked into it. And a great contrasting example, you know, imagine someone saying something in an anechoic chamber, and what you might hear and how a machine ASR system might be able to recognize that speech versus if you put that same person in a big cathedral and have them say the same thing where the sound you receive is going to be quite different, it's going to have all those reverberation effects and that'll make it harder for our ears. It can also will make it harder for the machine, the ASR system's ears as well, making it much harder to recognize the speech. So we know reverberation is a problem. It's going to affect ASR. And yet we of course want to be able to have high quality speech in many reverberant spaces, including spaces where the person speaking is quite far from the microphone, including spaces where there's high amounts of echoes and high amounts of um, uh, materials that are causing strong reverberation in a large space. So makes sense to explore how the reverberant speech can be automatically dereverberated. You wanna go from a spectrogram like the one on the left to the latent clean spectrogram like the one on the right that strips away all those reverberation effects to hear just what was, say, the sound uh, or the speech that was uttered. Now there's a wealth of literature for this very task. And what we noticed is that current methods are attacking this problem using the audio, doing things either with deep neural models or with um, signal processing and statistical methods. Um, but they are using the audio alone. And this is 
a limitation because it can under, under constrain the task that we're after. So as you might guess, what we're going to explore is how can we bring in the vision to make this more constrained so that we can get a better estimate of the clean speech. And I've already motivated how the visual cues um, about the room geometry materials and where the speaker is would help us do this stripping away, right? Because if we understand what the likely effects of those are on the speech we're hearing, then we'll be in a position to remove them. And here I'm showing you, you know, I've increased that example from the two on the left to two more where things like the distance of the human in the scene from the camera, um, as well as the size of the environment and its materials, like a big cathedral or a smaller classroom, these are all gonna affect how much reverberation you see on the output speech on the bottom row. So all that's happening because each of these has a different room impulse response and this RIR, and it's being convolved with um, the, the source sound or the true clean source sound to get the sound we receive, which is this reverberant sound AR. So our goal is to try to factor that out. We want to learn to see reverberate from both modalities, and then we'll see how that can play out for some downstream speech tasks. So let me tell you then how we went about training this. And there's, you know, if you think of our um, platform sound spaces as a way to generate training data for free at arbitrary positions and um, uh, for arbitrary sounds, then, you know, I think of this as a variant of self-supervised learning because this is controllable training data that we get to place and pair, right? We can pair up a true sound, a latent clean sound with the reverberated sound that we generate in this environment. And so that's how we started to train using simulated. I say simulated, remember these are real spaces. It's a real home. And there's some 88 of them, um, but they've been scanned so we can repeatably sample from them. So we took sound spaces as the platform. We used Matterport 3D environments and we took speech clips from Libra speech to generate training samples that couple the reverberant speech with the clean speech or A and those respectively are AR and AS. So that means you place you know, a, a human mesh, <laughs> you can see a tiny one in the, the middle of this panorama, in the environment on the left, place the camera where you want it, as well as the microphone, and then um, record this, these pairs on the right. And we know the ground truth um, diverberated audio in this case. As the chase drives away, Mary stands bewildered and perplexed on the doorstep. So there's a liver speech sample that's clean. And then we would insert it in the environment on the left. And the person is here standing in the back by that back window. And here's what the training pair would look like, or sound like. As the chase drives away, Mary stands bewildered and perplexed on the doorstep. So I hope you could hear how there was the clean source, the reverberant pair. And now you've got some good training data because you can start to learn then how to look at both the bottom spectrogram and the image on the left and try to infer the spectrogram on the top. So we'll be able to do that with data like this, but even more importantly, we also test, we're gonna test this idea using real collected data, meaning we pull in to an environment like this one, um, we collect it at auditoriums, meeting rooms, atriums, different um, spaces on a campus. And then we'll play the same kind of data sources from a loudspeaker held by a person in different parts of the environment and collect the, the audio from a microphone ourselves. So this is taking that same kind of setup but doing it in a, a real environment. All right, and that's what we'll test with. So now let me say a little bit about the model. Um, I've said the goal is to use the vision with the sound to de-reverberate. And so we'll start with the sound input. And here we're gonna take like a sliding window over time to do this processing. There's gonna be two components to this network. The one component is the visual one on the top here that's gonna look at the RGB panorama. It's gonna look at the depth that goes with it. And it's going to process those with ResNets and do some visual feature extraction and learn and embedding on the visual side. Now on the top bottom, you're going to have the part that looks at a sliding window through the, the input audio. And here it's a UNet style architecture that's going to, um, uh, do a encoder decoder here you see in the center in pink that tiles together both the audio features we're extracting with the visual from above. And importantly, the goal for D 
these coming together is to satisfy a loss that says we want the predicted spectrogram to match the ground truth for the uh, source sound. And we'll also say that we want the, the visual and audio features to respect a, a visual matching loss. Okay, so we're trying to learn how to strip away those effects. And importantly, we're going to do it by using RGB and depth together with the sound. So before I show you results, um, first let's look at what those embeddings look like that we've learned. So we've, you know, we had to learn embeddings for both the acoustic factors and the visual factors. And here I'm showing you TSNI plots on the left for the audio one and on the right for the visual one. And they're just 2D TSNIs that are color coded by two different things. On the left, color coded by distance between the camera and the speaker, the human speaker. And on the right, color coded according to the RT60 time. So the reverberation time to decrease by 60 um, decibels. And what does this mean? So the fact that the colors are clustering together reasonably well on both sides shows us that there is some learning happening in this embedding that respects these properties. Now we're never explicitly showing the training method that you know here is the distance between the camera and the person, but the audio embedding has realized that it's useful to rep represent this because it affects um, how well we can de-reverberate, knowing where how far away the camp person is. Similarly, on the right, the visual embedding is picking up on the audio acoustic properties of the room as captured it succinctly by the RT60 um, so that, again, it will be well positioned to be able to remove those room effects. So we have to identify what they are in order to be able to remove them. So this is kind of neat. It's just a suggestion that in the features that get learned, trained to do de-reverberation, these properties about the physical space are being ex uh, exposed. All right, so then let's first see, you know, what do these sound like? I showed you before the sample of that person speaking in this particular environment. Now let's hear how it's de-reverberated by our model, which is called VEDA for visually informed um, de-reverberation from audio. As the chase drives away, Mary stands bewildered and perplexed on the doorstep. So that's the output of the model that has stripped away, as you can also visibly see, you know, some of that reverberation. Here's another example. Here there's a bigger space. Um, well, the, the, it's a big space and the person is closer than the one I just showed you. So here's the clean speech. And he placed it in that gentleman's fingers who now took his turn at the lamp and contemplated the little parallelogram with a gleam of sly amusement. Okay, um, a very literary subject we have here. And then the reverberated one. And he placed it in that gentleman's fingers, who now took his turn at the lamp and contemplated the little parallelogram with a gleam of sly amusement. So actually here the reverberation is going to be more subtle given the nearness of the, the speaker. And let's hear our output. And he placed it in that gentleman's fingers, who now took his turn at the lamp and contemplated the little parallelogram with a gleam of sly amusement. Okay. And the final one I'll show here, here's a real sample that we captured with our own camera and microphone um, in a classroom. And the speaker is towards the very back of that environment. So here's the original clean ground truth. However, that was over now. The tree gone, the story at an end. Here's the actual um, sound that you capture when you record in this space. However, that was over now, the tree gone. The story had an end. And then finally the output of the model. However, that was over now. The tree gone. The story had an end. Okay, so I think you can hear in all of these, it's not perfect, um, but I think you can hear the, the cleaning up that's happening and that you can also view that, you know, instead of that spread in the spectrogram, it's tightening up around the, the core true latent speech. Now, in a moment, I'll show you that this all plays out with helping us do better downstream tasks. And one of them is speech recognition. Let's just look at a sample where we can see just how much the reverberation in the space damages the speech, off the shelf speech recognition, and then how much we can help it by doing this cleanup. So here is another input. Two monsters only were creating all this commotion. And before my eyes are two reptiles of the primitive world. Okay, and then in the space, it sounds like this. Two monsters only were creating all this commotion, 
and before my eyes are two reptiles of the primitive world. Okay, you can see in red the places where the ASR had a problem, and that's because the input speech is now realistic, it's reverberant, and it's much harder, increasing the word error rate. Two monsters only were creating all this commotion, and before my eyes are two reptiles of the primitive world. So that output was when we took the parallel of our model, but giving it only audio. So this is going to allow us to zoom in on what happens or what's the real benefit of the vision coming in. And that's the final example here. Two monsters only were creating all this commotion, and before my eyes are two reptiles of the primitive world. Okay, and this is a, a great example where we actually recognize all that speech. And so you can see how the vision and it's helping to, to do this more reliably. Now, the three tasks then we ultimately evaluated um, are as follows, speech enhancement, just what is the quality of the output to, um, for perceived quality on the left, speech recognition, like I was just showing, and then speaker verification, where we say whether two utterances seem to have come from the same speaker. And across these three tasks, compared to both a more traditional method um, uh, or to a, a modern learning-based method that has only audio, and that the latter one I'm referring to the metric GAN approach, um, we're able to have a good benefit. So the baselines, the, the baselines use audio only. Our VITA model introduces vision and it's paying off in terms of um, most cases for, for each of these three tasks. That's on data from our sound spaces and Matterport. We've done the same kind of tests with the the real data that I've been showing you before. And here um, also we're seeing some good benefit, um, particularly for the speech recognition and speaker verification. You'll notice that the metric GAN using audio alone, it has an edge here in terms of the speech quality uh, on this left-hand column. All right, so I wanna build from here. What I've just shown you is how this 3D space around us, of course, influences the speech we hear. And I was treating it as a damaging thing, right? It's like, let's get rid of that reverberation so we humans or our models can hear cleaner speech. But let's actually look at this in the other direction. Maybe the glasses have full, the glasses have um, empty because actually sometimes we really would like to have the correct reverberation on speech so that we hear things as if they do carry the effects of the environment. And this is, what's called for in a problem called acoustic matching, where you would like to insert a sound in a space and not make it sound like it's been pasted in there artificially, but make it sound like it's part of the space. That has great examples that I'm showing here, like in augmented reality, you'd like, say, someone who's speaking to you from you know, somewhere else to sound as if they're in the same space as you are. Or in film dubbing, where you want to insert the translated speech, but not have it sound like it was captured elsewhere, like as if it were captured in the movie you're watching in that space. Or finally in video conferencing where you, you know, these days we'd like someone to be able to put an arbitrary background and then wouldn't it be cool if they sound as if they were recorded in that space as well. So think of what I'm saying here calls for actually the opposite of what we just did because we have some speech and we want to add these room effects um, in order to hear them properly. So this brings me to our next idea, which is to um, consider what we call visual acoustic matching. So the visual being what's new here, we wanna be able to transform the sound that's recorded in one place to sound as if it were recorded in another one. And in particular, we want it to sound as if it were recorded in one that we observe in a photo. So in this case, the input will be source audio, a picture of the target space like this auditorium or theater on the top. And our job will be to create the output audio that moves that source audio sound to sound as if it took place over in that picture. And if we did it really well, this should be all the way to the point that it places the source in the scene at the right position with respect to the camera. So not just good enough for this environment, but good enough for the environment where the source is where it seems to be in the photo. So we call this visual acoustic matching. And I'm gonna go briefly over the model, but I'll first highlight two things about it that are important. So one is that the model is gonna use some visual attention to figure out how different parts of the scene contribute to the acoustics. And that will allow us to do things like be paying attention to surfaces in different parts of the room. And secondly, and most important probably for this workshop, we have a self-supervised objective to be able to leverage web videos to do this training. 
And this is actually pretty cool because it means we're gonna be able to learn, as I'll show you in a second, learn how to do this task from web videos of people speaking where we don't have control of the environment, where we don't have the room impulse response captured, but nonetheless, we can train um, as I'll show you just following. All right, so I said, I'll go briefly on the model. I'm, we have a model here that's going to learn how to produce that target sound. So on the input you have on the left is some source sound. Uh, maybe it's anechoic, but it doesn't need to be. So you have some source sound over here and you have a picture of where you wanna place that sound. So, you know, maybe it's what this guy is saying, but he said it somewhere else. And now I want it to sound like it's in this environment. And we'll have visual and audio streams as usual. Here we have a cross-modal encoder that's gonna perform um, cross-modal attention over these two. And then on the right, we're gonna um, uh, decode out into what is our target, which is the, um, the audio, our estimate of the audio in that space. Okay, so let's just take it at that for the moment. Um, but here's the key self-supervised part that I wanted to share, because if I'm trying to train this with arbitrary web video or, you know, the web video of people speaking, um, then what I don't have, I don't have a room impulse response. I don't have the ability to clean or remove reverberation from that sample in order to pair it and say, well, if the source was this, the target should be that. All I have is the target. I have the person in their space. They sound like they're in their space. So I have that target spectrogram. But here's our idea to self-supervise this. What we do is first de-reverberate. And I showed you our model for that. Um, we can do that now to take away some of that reverberation based on the, the physical space. And then the um, problem is that's actually not perfect. It's still going to carry a bit of elements of the original space. So we do a couple more processes where we will randomize that one further by convolving with the room impulse response of some arbitrary environment. That gets you the bottom right spectrogram and then we'll also add some noise to it. So this will give us then a plausible source spectrogram that if it works well, is preserving the content, like what was said, um, but has mismatched room acoustics. Okay, so now if you look at the left-hand side of my slide, you have what we'd like for training, which is a pair with a mismatch of environment. You have the sound in some real environment, that's the target. And then you have the sound in some other unknown environment that um, has different room acoustics. And that can be our input to pair these for training. Okay, and this is this step, this self-supervision step is what allows us to train with web videos. We could of course train this from sound spaces and we do, but now we can also train it from web videos that, that we don't have so much control over. Okay, so that adds this element to the pipeline I showed you a moment ago, where if the input is um, from a, a web video for which we have no mismatch audio, we generate ourselves in that self-supervised way. All right, so that was a brief overview of the model, give you the general idea. Let me show you a slide of examples. So on the left is an input spectrogram. I'm gonna play that raw sound first. Stuff it into you, his belly counsel. Okay, and now if you go from left to right, I'm inserting that sound into the environments depicted in each of these scenes. So there are different people in these scenes, don't worry about that. What we're trying to do is place that sound I just played into the room in the office, into the garage, into the auditorium. And so I'll first play the office. Stuff it into you, this belly council. Now the garage. Stuff it into you, this belly council. Stuff it into you, this belly council. So I hope you could hear that as we go from left to right, as the spectrograms also show, the inferred audio is more reverberant in the larger uh, spaces. And that was in this model, you know, captured by the picture that says how it should sound so that it would sound realistic in that space. Um, let's look at a couple other samples here. I was motivating with augmented reality. So here, what if we had the input sound first? If a man had stolen a pound in his youth. And now we insert it here. If a man had stolen a pound in his youth. So that should, you know, the goal here is to make it sound more like those people were speaking to you in this environment. Finally, what about that video conferencing? Maybe the input sound is this. Yea, his honorable worship is within. And we want to insert it so it sounds like her Zoom background. Yea, his honorable worship is within. Okay. Um, so you can start to, I hope here, I mean, subject to 
ironically, you know, all the Zoom channel we're going through here, but I hope you can hear those subtle differences. Okay, and we've evaluated all of this, um, both on sound spaces tests on the left, as well as in ABC, uh, ABC speech data set um, that we've used for training um, that as I just described earlier in a self-supervised way. All right, so this was visual acoustic matching. And um, I'm looking at our time. I think that we want to reserve some time for questions. So I'm gonna go briefly then for this remainder part and then we'll close and, and discuss. So um, the last piece I was going to show is about self-supervised audio source separation. And there's a really powerful idea here that's been explored in the literature lately to self-supervise the training where, you know, if we want to learn how to separate out the sounds in a, in a mixed audio track, first of all, we can use the video to do it better. But second of all, we can train it by mixing sounds um, that didn't happen together and then training to learn how to separate them. And you can do this for free without human annotation by mixing the audio from the two and then knowing that you ought to recover the audio from either one. And this has been a really great learning um, paradigm that people have explored, including us in different ways. Um, and what I wanted to emphasize in our latest work on this, um, in this realm has to do with, again, human speech, um, but now really focused on the fact that people talk over one another and we wanna hear one at a time. And this is the well-known cocktail par party problem um, where we, could, we as humans can do it reasonably well, but we'd like machines that can also do it and machines that could even assist us in doing it. And so here's our insight for this part of the work. Um, we'd like to leverage um, this intuition. So here I'm gonna play you a speech excerpt. You decide who said it. You might have a guess who said it of my five faces here. It was face number two. Maybe her voice is expected to sound pretty different from some of the others. Uh, what about this one? People being um, cool and, and you can see that uh, in, in daily life. Harder maybe, but you might have a guess of who spoke that one of my five. It was face number four. So the question is, if we can do this, you know, what are we relying on? What are aspects that tell us a prior about the voice we're going to hear given their appearance? Well, it's physical things. It seems like the shape of the person's face, their body weight, the gender, the age, the nationality, all of these things might be, might be visible and might allow us to better expect a, a correlation between the voice and what we see. And indeed, this has been um, pursued in a number of recent papers to be able to learn this kind of cross-modal embedding to relate faces to voices. And what our idea is, um, is that this is also quite important and valuable for speech separation. And here's why. So the two tasks work together. They could, this was our idea. Because on the one hand, if we were trying to separate the soundtracks from this overlapping speech in the top, then um, if we had done that really well so that we had soundtracks for each speaker separate, then we would be able to learn an embedding that relates voices to faces better because we'd be working with isolated voices. And on the flip side, if we went from the bottom and we had a good embedding that relates voices to faces, we would be able to do the separation better because we'd look at these faces and have a prior about what the voice we're listening for amongst the mixed sound should sound like. Okay, so it's like a, a good cycle between um, being able to separate voices and being able to have a prior on the, the voices we hear for a given face. And so we built a model called visual voice that does just this. It takes that mix and separate kind of model and learns jointly um, how to perform the separation as well as how to compute oops, this um, cross-modal embedding. Maybe I'll just show you an, um, an example of this. So if we start with the input speech like so. No, you became no, a superstar. No, I did not. Yes, no, you I did. did not. No, sure I did you not. did. From are me, you gonna, are I you gave let you me full speak credit. If you're talking am, to me now, am I, gonna speak I gave my you piece? full credit for that. Am I going to speak my piece or not? Go am ahead. I going to speak my piece or not? Go ahead. Okay, because you want to interview me. I ain't interviewing you. You want to talk to me. I don't want I don't worry about talking Floyd, to you. You want to talk to me. go ahead. I'm waiting on you. So we're used to this kind of, you know, unfortunately, people speaking over each other, but with the ability to do the separation, here is what we hear for the left speaker. Well, you became a superstar. Yes, you did. Sure you did. From me, I gave you full credit. If you're talking to me now, I gave you full credit. Okay, and on the right, 
No, 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 I did not. No, I did not. No, I did not. Are you gonna let Are you gonna let me speak my piece? Am Am I gonna speak my piece? Am I gonna speak my piece or not? Am I gonna speak my piece? Okay. And so for time, I'm yep. gonna skip some of our other samples here. Um, please see the website to get more of them. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna tell you just one more item and um, highlight the Eagle 4D data set. Um, one thing that we know about speech separation in the literature, including our own prior work, has been, you know, it's processing video that's pre-recorded. And so something we're exploring now, kind of bringing together the ideas I've been talking about all along today is that we can think about speech separation in a physical 3D environment where in the active setting, we actually control the camera and microphone. And so in our active audiovisual source separation work that we call Move to Hear, we're looking at how to use the sound and vision together to navigate in a space so that we can do separation better. And this means we're training agents that can move intelligently, say from the starred position to this current robot position, in order to understand one source, like source number three, amidst mixed sources altogether. So in other words, you move into, you get into this house, the piano's playing, someone's speaking over here, someone's speaking over there. Um, and rather than sit still and try to listen to one of the human speakers, we have agents that are, we're training to move to where are places in the environment that they can separate that target speech much better. And it, it, what's exciting or interesting is not simply a matter of going to the speaker, First of all, you might have a budget of time to do this. And second of all, you can use the physical environment to your advantage. For example, stepping behind a wall or in front of a wall um, in order to hear one sound over the others. Okay. And again, just for time, I wanna hop to, to highlight the Ego 40 data set and then we'll close. Um, and this is a project that is not just from my group. This is a project um, with 80 plus collaborators from 13 different universities. That, and it's a project that's been going on for the last two plus years. And we are really excited because we've just released um, the, the project, the benchmark and the data set. So all of this is publicly available. And why I thought it might be of interest to this group um, includes the fact that it's multimodal. So what Eagle4D is, is a collection of first person head mounted camera data that contains not just video, but often audio, IMU, multi-camera capture, and it's people doing daily life activity like you see here from some 74 worldwide locations. So the partners in the consortium that form this project are at universities around the world. And they've given cameras to people in the local community to capture stuff like you're seeing here. And now this comes to us in a, in a data set from nearly a thousand different camera wearers with great geographic and occupational diversity doing unscripted daily life activity. And this was all collected with very rigorous privacy and ethics standards, so that it's ready for um, intensive research. And we're really quite excited about the breadth of the data um, and what it can allow for our research challenges. And in particular, I would highlight for this group the fact that we have two benchmarks accompanying this data set on the bottom left that have to do with audiovisual diarization, so we have annotated data for, for the videos like I just showed you saying who said what when, as well as social interaction saying who's talking to the camera wear or who's looking at the camera wear. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna stop here and um, to thanks so much for your attention. Be glad to have any comments or questions. Okay, thank you very much for Professor Grumman for the excellent talk. So uh, any question from the audience, if you have any question, you can raise your hand or type your question in the chat room. So any question from the audience? While we are waiting for people thinking their question, I have one. So I found that several experiments is trained the model on simulated world. Then it worked well on the real environment. Uh, this kind of surprise. Uh, are there any mismatch between the simulated world and the real world? Are there some case they fail or what, what is the reason that the result is so good on the real world? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So certainly you're right that things are harder when we have this sim to real gap, um, but a few thoughts. So one, let's remember like the visuals are very real themselves um, because these are really photographed environments. They're just been um, brought to a mesh form so we can sample arbitrary views. So it's real in that regard. So that, that smooths out one possible domain mismatch. For example, if we were doing computer graphics over to pictures. Um, 
The other thing is, you know, the, the test domain in the real case, we are sticking to indoor environments. So we can notice none of my samples were, you know, taking this camera outdoors. And that's consistent with what the, the captured simulated environments offer. Um, and their, their households, like, I think that the, there's nonetheless a visual domain gap. And if you look at the absolute errors of what we can do in a SIM test set, a held out SIM test set versus the real test set, there's, you know, it's harder, right? So the absolute errors go up. And that you can definitely attribute that at least to this domain um, gap. Now, it does suggest, you know, more and more work that as people are doing to try and um, use domain adaptation or, or, or ways to, to remove that gap even further. Um, and, you know, ultimately you can think in some cases, think of that simulator, it's just a tool, right? We could do similar kind of training in the real world as well. You know, this is yet another approach, but it's been convenient to allow us to do this large scale training and have very systematic evaluation because now you always have ground truth. Um, so there's certain trade-offs there, even for the research part. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Justin. Uh, did you discover any optimal songs, uh, pin, band, ring that work best in developing your echolocation for depth model? Were the songs used for the echolocation standardized? Yeah, so it's a great question. And, you know, what we did is use a frequency sweep to kind of expose, you know, a very short, so a very short emitted sound so that we'd be ready to listen for the echoes. Um, and a sweep over frequencies so that we would expect kind of the richest response from the environment with respect to all, you know, the array of frequencies. And we haven't extensively tried other, you know, emitted sounds, but this was the rationale for what we did. More recently, we are exploring how we can be even active about the sounds that get emitted, whether for depth estimation or mapping, because um, you can imagine that um, you might be able to optimize with respect to the environment, you know, what what sounds should be emitted. So far, we think we have found in these later results then that the frequency sweep was well motivated and, and consistent with the literature. This does give a rich response, um, but there's still room to balance other criteria to say exactly how much sound and how long of a sound we want to emit, um, say if there's other factors that would, you know, not want us banging on pots and pans, I guess, to, to sense the environment or to bang on the, the gate like the character did. So due to time limitation, probably the last very quick question. So for the reparation, did you use single channel audio input or multi-channel audio input? Yeah, so we were using single channel there. I think, thank you very much. Yeah, I, there are still some questions, but due to time limitation, I think we have to stop at here. Let's thank Professor Groman again. Thank you very much for your excellent talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.